Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. After more than three and a half months of waiting, SpaceX fans got an opportunity to see Booster 9 fire up on the launch pad, carrying out a 2.74 second static fire. However, the static fire was supposed to be five seconds and four engines failed during the process. What does this mean and how likely is it that Starship is going to be launching anytime soon? And meanwhile, back at Boeing, things have gone from bad to worse. The Starliner now has been delayed until March, at the very earliest, March of 2024, that is. And we are talking about the completion of a safe spacecraft, theoretically, not when it's actually going to launch. The question remains... How much harder do we have to try? How many risks need we take just to produce a spacecraft that's going to launch a mere six times between the end of 2024 and 2030? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon. Once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. As of right now, we are only four days away from the opening date of my lecture tour, my How Starship Will Save the World North America tour. It starts in Polk City, Florida. If you don't have your ticket yet and you live in that region of Florida, well, I'm not coming back. It's going to be my only stop in Florida, at least for the foreseeable future. So if you want to check it out, $10 online and you can pay through PayPal or through Patreon or through GoFundMe. A lot of different ways to do that and then just email me and I will email you back not only your ticket but also a confirmation for a digital copy of my book. Okay, enough of that. Let's get back to two companies that really need to be saved from themselves. Let me say that again. Two companies that need to be saved from from themselves. What am I talking about here? Clearly Boeing is having serious problems right now, but what about SpaceX? What about Starship? Why am I talking this way about Starship? Certainly, even though there are doubtlessly going to be some problems during the development of Starship, SpaceX is plunging ahead very, very quickly. Everything is looking very promising in terms of the eventual success of the most powerful rocket in human history. Well, let me tell you, both companies are in a world of hurt right now in terms of the potential of things that could go wrong and the consequences associated with it and both companies could face disaster if the worst happens. I do my best to share my honest opinions on this channel and images like this scare the hell out of me because quite frankly, if the worst were to happen to Booster 9 and the whole thing went up in a massive mushroom cloud at that particular moment, most probably small bits of stainless steel would have rained down on these people and there would have been very few places to hide unless they dove under the water at exactly the right moment and stayed there. Now, of course, the odds of something very serious occurring are pretty low during a static fire, but not beyond the realm of possibility. Because keep in mind, this static fire lasted for 2.47 seconds when it should have lasted for five, and four engines failed immediately. Now, to be fair, the deluge system seems to be working extremely well, at least as far as suppressing noise is concerned, and as far as avoiding any sort of serious damage, well, once again, we can't say that with any sort of confidence because the engines were simply not lit for a long enough period of time to determine what the consequences might be. Keep in mind that this is an entirely different system than what NASA uses. NASA uses water deluge systems 
only for sound suppression, not to protect the launch pad from the full force of a 33-engine takeoff. That being said, though, it did seem to work well, but once again, we can't say for certain. Did a sudden and massive cloud of steam billowing underneath the launch pad cause any sort of malfunction with the propulsion system? It's very possible. Once again, difficult to tell why the static fire lasted only half the time that a traditional static fire should have lasted, but nevertheless, at least we didn't have any explosions. Once again, if any of you think that I am exaggerating about the potential damage that an exploding booster might wreak, well, let's have a look at a similar tactical nuclear size explosion that took place in Halifax Harbor back in 1917. And no, that's not a picture of the Hiroshima blast, nor is it a picture of some sort of secret nuclear weapon that existed a hundred years ago. All it is is a conventional explosion produced by a hell of a lot of flammable and explosive devices, all of which were packed on board the SS Mont Blanc, which was scheduled to take these explosives over to Europe to wage war against Germany during the conflict known as the War to End All Wars or World War. War one. During this particular incident, the Mont Blanc was trying to make its way into the harbor while another ship called the Emo was making its way out of the harbor on the wrong side of the channel. Both ships signaled to one another to make way. There was some confusion, and at the last moment, the Mont Blanc tried to evade a collision with the Emo, the Emo being responsible for all of this, but a collision occurred. The collision produced a shower of sparks that ignited the most flammable substance that the Mont Blanc had on board, a substance called benzol, and started a raging fire. The Mont Blanc was on a secret mission, so nobody in the harbor had the slightest idea as to the explosive contents that were being carried in its hold. But the crew sure as hell did, and they abandoned ship immediately, knowing that their situation was untenable. They began screaming warnings to anybody who would listen, but they spoke French, and very few people people in Halifax spoke that language. It was the wrong part of Canada for that. Once the crew reached the shoreline, they ran for their lives. In the process, they happened to notice a Native American woman clutching her baby, not understanding their warnings. One of the crewmen had an inspired idea and grabbed her baby and ran off with it. And as he anticipated, she ran after them trying to get her baby back. And in the process, he saved both of their lives. Unfortunately, they didn't save much of anybody else. Approximately 20 minutes after the fire started, the ship exploded with a force the equivalent of approximately two and a half kilotons. Two and a half kilotons, or about 12% of the explosive force of the Hiroshima bomb. And even though it wasn't nearly as powerful as that epic historic explosion, the damage it created was unbelievable. Every single building within a two and a half kilometer radius was completely leveled down to its foundations. Almost 2,000 people were killed instantly. 9,000 were injured. More than 300 of those injuries ended up being fatal in the long run. Now keep in mind, it's been estimated that this explosion was roughly the same as the explosion created by the N1 explosion. Now even if it was perhaps twice as powerful, debris would still easily reach South Padre Island and also Port Isabel. Keep in mind that the Mont Blanc's forward 90mm gun, a cannon for all practical purposes, was thrown 5.6 kilometers away from the blast. The beach where most of the spectators watch Starship take off and do its static fires is only about three and a half kilometers further away from that. If that explosion could throw a 90 millimeter cannon 5.6 kilometers, it could definitely throw sizable shards of stainless steel a hell of a lot further than that. 
The pressure generated by the shock wave of the Halifax explosion was roughly the equivalent of the oceanic pressure experienced down at the wreck of the Titanic. Therefore, windows as far away as 100 kilometers from the blast were either broken or burst in a hail of broken glass. And to make matters worse, a tsunami was formed by water surging in to fill the void created by the explosion. It rose up as high as 18 meters above the high water mark on the Halifax size of the harbor. Now, most probably a starship explosion wouldn't create an effect like that because the starship would not explode in the middle of the water. But nevertheless, we could probably expect a substantial conventional wave to accompany the shock wave if something like that were to happen. What's my point? Am I trying to say that we shouldn't launch Starship? That this is the wrong place to be launching such a powerful rocket? Well, no. In my opinion, this is highly unlikely to happen. SpaceX is taking a lot of precautions to make sure that a full-fledged pad explosion doesn't take place. However, given what we've just seen on the pad, in my opinion, we need another static fire. A static fire with a full five-second duration to see what that's going to do. We really need to know all the facts here because the consequences of a pad explosion, an airburst just over the pad, or even worse, the rocket going off target, the flight termination system failing to activate, and the rocket coming crashing down on spectators. Definitely something that could have happened had Starship gone off target back on April 20th. And once again, all I'm trying to emphasize is we're not playing with a pop bottle rocket here. This thing is not a toy. It's the most powerful rocket in human history by a long shot. And it's capable of producing a hell of a lot of damage if it isn't treated with a great deal of caution. And what I'm concerned about is that SpaceX is not going to do the necessary testing. They're going to push ahead come hell or high water because that's how they do things. That's how they did it on April 20th. They knew damn well that that launch pad was not well suited to a 33 engine takeoff, but they did it anyway and the FAA let them do it anyway. And I am very concerned that given the fact that SpaceX just carried out this test fire with the deluge system going full blast even though in theory they don't have the necessary environmental permits to be doing these things, it really makes me wonder, is anybody standing in SpaceX's way? Is there a voice of caution and reason that's going to hold this process back to make sure that the surrounding population is as safe as they possibly can be? Or is Starship plowing ahead, heedless of consequences, just as the Mont Blanc was over a hundred years ago? Okay, enough apocalyptic talk. Let's talk about a spacecraft that might only kill a few people sometime in the near future, the Boeing Starliner. After all of the problems that Starliner has experienced with the valve problems and the software errors, and now flammable electrical tape and previously undetected parachute issues? What the hell is going on here? Well, whatever the problems are, and by the way, they are pretty significant, it's going to delay the advent of this spacecraft until March of 2024 at the very earliest. And keep in mind, Boeing is already one and a half billion dollars in the red on this ship. They cannot afford another unmanned test. Instead, what's coming up next, come hell or high water, does that sound kind of familiar, is the crew flight test or the CFT, which is going to fly as soon as the chutes are ready, according to Mark Nappy. Boeing Starliner's program manager, quote, the chutes will drive the readiness for potential launch dates. And right now, based on the current plans, we're anticipating that we're going to be ready with the spacecraft in early March. That does not mean that we have a launch date in early March. That means that we are ready with the spacecraft then. Steve Stitch, the manager of NASA's commercial crew program, said, quote, what I know everybody would like is a launch date. 
Well, speak for yourself, Steve. I really don't want to see this thing fly ever. Given all of the previously undetected issues that reared their ugly heads only a few weeks before this thing was supposed to carry people up to the ISS, I have zero confidence that this spacecraft is ever going to be safe, especially since Boeing is going to be using cost-cutting measures to try to make it safe while not bankrupting their company at the same time. Keep in mind that Boeing received $4.2 billion to develop Starliner, to build the necessary spacecraft, and to carry out six flights to the ISS. That $4.2 billion, given the fact that they're already $1.5 billion in the red, is likely gone or almost completely gone. And on those six flights, Boeing is going to have to spend even more money to get the ship into orbit. That is assuming that all of the fixes they need to put into place between now and March of next year don't amount to a tremendous amount of money, which, by the way, it almost certainly will, given the the fact that they need to work through the spacecraft's entire electrical system and test the parachutes again. Those are not cheap processes. Boeing will undoubtedly be losing millions of dollars with every one of these six launches and will be trying to cut costs wherever possible because with every million dollars they plow into the Starliner program, their other programs are losing valuable revenue. That's something that Boeing simply cannot allow to happen and something they're going to try to mitigate as much as possible. And with every million dollars of mitigation, the risks increase even more for every man and woman that fly on this ship. And it is very unlikely to fly any more missions beyond those six dedicated to the ISS between now and 2030. Nobody is going to buy this ship. Nobody is going to buy seats on this ship. Not when you have Crew Dragon with 10 successful flights under its belt as a less expensive and more reliable alternative. Plus, you have Dream Chaser coming out in approximately three years. The crude version of Dream Chaser, that is. And to make matters even worse, ULA has six very valuable Atlas V missions dedicated to Starliner. Atlas Vs that could be redirected to military missions that it's currently missing out on because of the delays with Vulcan Centaur. With all of the problems and all of the potential risks represented by Starliner, it's time for NASA to finally pull the damn plug. Let's hope they do it sometime before March of next year. Please smash that like, hit that subscribe. It's very important to the success of my channel. Also, please check the description for various ways to support this content. And don't forget my first tour date coming up on Saturday later this week. Once again, guys, thanks for watching. And as always, stay angry about space.